Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piskor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. Today, uh, we're going to look at a comic by Barry Windsor Smith that could only be colored by Barry Windsor Smith. Uh, but before we do that, I want to invite you guys to like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell notification icon so that we can notify you whenever new videos are available to help mitigate that kayfabe effect. Uh, what happens is we talk about comics, I uh, put the videos out in the morning, and by the afternoon those comics are gone from Amazon, eBay, and your local comic shop. So you get first dibs if we uh, deliver this video directly to you. And if you play the video to the end of, uh, to its completion, then that pushes the video out to uh, other comic book loving YouTube viewers uh, who might not have seen much cartoonist kayfabe content uh, before. Helps the channel out a lot. Uh, so fellas, man, X-Men 205, Uncanny X-Men 205 from 1986, May. Uh, one of those things, a little cup of coffee with Barry Windsor Smith coming in between, like, a po post-Paul Smith, pre-John uh, Romita, I believe. Yeah, I think John Romita is referenced in the back of this issue. You know, like, he'll be back next issue with, with uh, Dan Green. Um, man, I have lots of thoughts. Like, just looking at this cover, yeah. Weapon X Zero. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. um, he, he said that. He said that he drew that cover, and then it got him thinking about what would be the story behind this cover. It makes total sense to hear him say that. The other thing, uh, 1986 zine, I love that this is 1986, but we read a Jim Shooter deposition, and he talks about, like, uh, really the only artist that he gives credit to pumping up sales, Barry Windsor Smith, whenever he'd pop in on one of these X-Men uh, fill-in issues, and this is the stuff, you yeah. know? Yeah, it, uh, pulling this one out cold and giving it a read really puts your mind back in that place when you would, like, grab your first X-Men comic, have no idea what's happening before, after, or, or during. And usually that's Chris Claremont's many subplots running. Mm -hmm. This one is like Barry Windsor Smith drawings, where it's just like, <laughs> I don't know which end is up. And, and those colors are just great. Like, they, they kind of do it, have a physiological effect on you. And it's really hard to get orange and pink to work together, and, and he's doing it there. So we're looking at uh, the Essential X-Men number 6 volume that contains uh, the issues of X-Men uh, 199 to 213, plus the New Mutant Special Edition X-Men Annual 9, some X-Factor, some New Mutants. We have crossovers and stuff with Power Pack. This is really worth getting because you have, you know, 70, 80 pages of pristine art atoms in black and white. This was that weird period of comic book color where the dots were far apart, like that flexographic printing where uh, it just looks like these characters have measles. It looks like Mobius whenever you mm -hmm. see it as a line art form. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have to imagine Mobius as a part of the the um, Art Adams soup. Uh, but, I mean, like 80 pages of this stuff in pure black and white where you can really study that art because the color at this time, a little weak on uh, some of the titles, but it actually isn't weak here. You know, like they used better better uh, print technology for some books rather than others, man. Uh, G.I. Joe got real bad color treatment mm -hmm. also. where And it would be like, you know, this flesh tone, the dots would be thicker and further apart. So it really did look like all the characters had measles and stuff. But uh, these kind of color tones, first off, you look at this black and white. What is that? <laughs> what is what is Joe Rosas going to do with that? What is Uncle Greg Wright going to do with that, man? Like, they're going to be earning their pay with that no kind of about stuff. It. But Barry Windsor Smith is drawing this with his color in mind. And, man, when you talk about Weapon X Zero, like, this is that great foretelling. Like, this is the origin of um, Lady Deathstrike. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comic books that Ed Piscor and I make. Available now in your local comic shops or online wherever you buy comics and books is Red Room, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Season 1, the Antisocial Network, available as a collected trade paperback. Season 2, Trigger Warnings. Issue 1 is now out. Issue 2, coming soon, if not already out whenever you see this video. Banned in 26 countries, banned in 7 comic shops, but they can still order them for you. So be sure and ask for it by name. And the rest of Ed's bibliography available still in print, WYSIWYG Portrait of a Serial Hacker, X-Men Grand Design, three oversized treasury volumes of that, and Hip Hop Family Tree, four oversized treasury volumes of that as well as, well as two box sets. 
And coming to comic shops in March and April, Hulk Grand Design, a reimagining of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk, over 500 comic books, over 10,000 pages condensed into two oversized issues, telling the complete story of the Incredible Hulk, and available in several beautiful eye-catching covers, Marcos Martin, Peach Momoko, and cartoonist Kayfabe's own Ed Piscor. And coming in April, Hulk Grand Design Madness, covers by me, Ed McGinnis, and Jeff Darrow. Also available in comic shops and book sellers, Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive from Image Comics, A Homeless Ninja on a Skateboard, and The Plain Janes with writer Cecil Castellucci, possibly the first uh, young adult graphic novel here in America. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. I wonder so much how he even does these colors because as, as, as we go through this issue, you'll see like edges are rounded. You know, they're not, they're not blended exactly, but it's all organic, the coloring. So is he doing guides where he's doing this almost like a watercolor and then handing it off to somebody who's doing separations and then like mm -hmm. painting onto the color plates and stuff to, to yeah. make those shapes? Because look, you know, they're, they're organic and he uses white as a color. Right. What, what you're talking about sounds kind of spot on because as we get a little bit later when we get into his like storyteller book, you kind of see what I imagine is exactly what he was pr producing. He was producing, yeah, these watercolors and then it's like, okay see what you can do with these. Yeah, you know, he spent he spent the late 70s, early 80s. You know, this is him coming back to comics after he said he was done with comics. Uh, he did his Gore Blimey Press stuff where he is the head, you know, he's the he's the guy making all the decisions with color and uh, stuff. So so he, he knows what you can squeeze out of it. And maybe he even uh, developed some relationship with that Connecticut chemical color mm -hmm. factory, man. Also, uh, looking at this the other night, I was admiring... He's drawing like snow covered streets with like the ruts from tr tire tire. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Yes. Ridiculous. It's when you see drawing like this, this artist is really like he's not listening to, uh, like he is yeah. projecting his full brain mm -hmm. into the image. He's like this lighting is accurate to the shadows on the uh, ground and the shadows are very uneven for mm -hmm. the sort of little piles and peaks and valleys of of the snow that's there uh seeing the like the building is lit and it gets darker when it's further away from street lights so in a as a black and white image it's successful and then when he hits it with color come on now yeah, he's got his own set of standards that, you know, that are uniquely his. And imagine, like, when you're drawing a snow scene, snow is great because you can get away with not drawing stuff, you know, but he's drawing, like, every right. facet of that he's snow. He's doing extra. Yeah. He also draws a lot in color. You know, you look yeah. at how detailed this line work is, whether we're looking at black and white or the, or the comic book, tons of detail in the line work, but then you start to see, like, the highlights that he's putting on that are these other shapes. Like, he's drawing in color on top of the drawn ink. Yeah. And look at this interesting stuff like shadows from the snowflakes on mm -hmm. on the girl's hair in green. Yeah, yeah you're not getting that from a, 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 se a second party. You, uh, yes, of course. And But I do think that this color does inform the Marvel colorists going forward. I, th I think that this moved the needle because some of these kind of tones you would see employed afterward. Uh, it wouldn't be the same treatment, obviously. And a lot of colors, like, they're not doing this, like, modeling mm -hmm. like that. But when he establishes these colors, and it's it's a it's an indigo color, but when he uses it as for skin shading, the colorists recognize that this is a tool that, that, that can be used. So many cool colors uh, in that snow there. Like, you could probably identify three, four, but then he'll cut in some pinks. And, you know, you juxtapose that against that red on that wounded wolf. Do you think he lettered the title? No. No. Yeah. No. Orzakowski earns his payment. That's, that's like an Orzakowski uh, riff. I wonder what these things look like in pencil form whenever Orzakowski's lettering, or if he goes in with, like, an overlay to letter them. Right. Because think of how much graphite's on this page. <laughs> yeah. The amount, the, the way he's treating snow too is ex extraordinary to me because we've seen tons of, snow such a fun thing to draw. Yeah. Or, or at least to look at. Mm -hmm. Right. What he's doing is violent blizzard. This isn't like, mm -hmm. it's, it's a Christmas story where we have some snow happening. It is like motion of snow, you know, wind and things that he's drawing. Yeah, for sure. And he will cut stuff with white media. 
but then he'll also draw sort of the underside, the undercarriage of, of certain mm -hmm. um, snowflakes right there. You know, he's putting in the shadow there. But I look at this and, and I like I just don't exactly know what I'm looking at. You stare long enough, a face emerges. Another colorist, I mean, we, we see reasonably clear Kirby pages that, you know, Iron Man isn't colored exactly right and stuff. Yeah, this would be the ultimate test if you were going to give somebody samples. You know how, like, you used to be able to write to Marvel for, like, photocopy <laughs> pencils for samples? Right. Uh, to, to try inking or whatever? This would be the page to send out as your, uh, as, as your rib <laughs> to, to want to be colorists. They would do that dick stuff. I remember in Wizard, there was a Mark Wade script for a Flash comic, and it was about, like, a circus or a zoo that had animals escape. So now you're drawing tigers and elephants and all that kind of stuff, and it's like... That, sure, that could come up, but come on, man. You're really stretching. It's, it's like wrestling. You're stretching a dude. Yes. Interesting, too. Uh, this reminds me of Mike Mignola in that foreground, middle ground, background, where he's doing cool colors in the foreground, the shadows on Wolverine's face and hair, cool colors in the background, that purple, and then, like, your warm colors is, uh, I forget even what her Power name is. Power pack chick. Yeah, in the, in the middle there with that warm color. It's the same principles as you see in a lot of Mignola's magic where he's able to get like three layers out of black and white. One of the pieces I was mentioned earlier about like you come into a um, Claremont X-Men comic cold and you don't know what the hell's going on. Like this Wolverine is not like your typical Wolverine. I think he just come back from Japan or, or so, mm -hmm. like something happened. We don't know what it is. And it's never really explained. No. It reminds me of the Barry Windsor Smith interviews that we've read. Uh, on this channel that we've gone through in Wizards and stuff, where he talks about the Marvel storytelling and how that total exposition, he hates it. Like, right. it's it's for, you know, who, who are you writing for like that? And he finds it embarrassing. You see his version of writing in this story because this stuff isn't overly explained. Right. Pretty dramatic whenever you go from all these exterior snowstorm pieces to inside of the cab. Yeah. You know, for the stuff that is very hard to sort of make out totally different once we switch environments there. and the way he does like modeling on the faces he'll do like like a blob of of pink and then an overlapping blob of like the purple or like a like a blue mixed with that pink and then some white highlight um anybody else i mean that 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 face would just it would just be flesh and then maybe you'd do some shading but like to have the shading and the highlight and and the place where they meet is kind of awesome that use of white as a color i don't know who else does that mm -hmm. no. especially at this time period you know like probably now it's done more but that seems really new to me. Mm -hmm. His his like choice of draw, like the way he draws these faces with these super far apart eyes, like that's that's a very liberating thing for me to see. Certainly when I was like younger, where you hear hear about an established rule set and you feel like you have to follow it, and it's an example of like no, you don't. And 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 furthermore, this is Bar Barry Windsor Smith. Like it's it's identifiable. It becomes it becomes a trademark piece of one style. And and her eyes change within it. You know, much like manga or something, where she's she's got kind of like cartoon eyes in one, and then she's got like realistic eyes in another. These poor Reavers, man, they can never, they can never get one over on on Wolvie. Because good triumphs over evil. Though. <laughs> well, yeah, because this is like this is just like painting with the color, you know. You're not just, it's it's not just like a technical thing where you're, you know, coloring in, you're you're continuing the, the, the drawing. I think this is where I, I realized that like this page and, and these panels in particular where that stood out to me. Mm -hmm. And he's clearly leaving room for that stuff in his yeah. inking choices, completely negative space. And then you see that he creates that bridge just with the color. The other place that he does really great drawing is the shadows on the snow. Yeah. You know, that would just be, you can see it's just wide open bringing that light blue in and and a purple like mm -hmm. it's it's a couple values it's so well referenced too like you you've seen these kind of like construction sites where it's, you got the just a rickety fence that you <laughs> just cobble together real quick man to, to just keep people people out you know there's a gulf there like a little gully for them to fall down Listen, I don't know who, who to blame for this, but where is the Barry Windsor Smith Artist Edition? Yeah. I need to see these pages. I need to know if this lettering is put on afterwards. It, <laughs> it, it makes me think it almost has to be. <laughs> so cheesy right here. <laughs> he just, he just like, his eyes meet her. He's speaking in Japanese, so it's like, this dude is conflicted, and when he gets ultimately frustrated, why do I not know myself? Rah! <laughs> <laughs> That's well, yeah, this funny. is this is the feral Wolverine. No, oh, yeah, it's such a good storytelling concept. This issue too, because 
you think like get in late, get out early, mm-hmm. you know, don't show anything extra. We don't see the damage Wolverine suffers. We right. see him making noises instead of speaking because he's so messed up. What we get to see is Wolverine being Wolverine. Right, absolutely. Peak, peak Wolverine, if you will. How about this great kind of like level of depth? Yeah, it's good mm-hmm. stuff. With these sort of foreground characters, all that lumber back there. And drawing these tiny figures like that and kind of keeping them keeping them well proportioned and stuff, it's not simple. Mm-mm. That ain't easy at all. Like you you probably have to have that jeweler's loop freaking magnifying glass that you see on some guy's drawing desks to uh to, to hit that. It's a good color piece too, the, yeah. the color version of that because it's the lighter cyan for your background colors. Yeah. And you see like those figures in the foreground, they're still cyan, but now you're getting the hundred percent. It you it know? creates a, like a nice rhythm too, because you have all this like local color and stuff and then you have this like largely blue thing that kind of gives your eye a little relief. <laughs> it's funny talking about eye relief when you see the stuff in black yeah. and white. <laughs> yeah, not even giving you the white gutters. Right. T- taking the world's busiest art and making it a little bit more busy. Wolverine made these Reaver dudes. He made them this way. You know, they were those dudes with that kind of Iron Man face. And then, uh, no, no respect. So I guess he designed and created Lady Deathstrike. It's a good design. Yeah, you assume so. You know, it's funny, like, because I, I read this as, like, a Barry Windsor Smith fan, just like, oh, here's a Barry Windsor Smith. I read it out of context. So I assumed all my questions were answered in the previous <laughs> issue and then in the following issue. Yeah, These, I, I don't think there is any more, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> These are the marks, like, and this is the stuff that you can imagine that Jim Lee saw. And, and Scott Williams popped up in comments before when we were t- looking at some of their comics and, and seeing the weird highlights that would be drawn on... Mm-hmm. Uh, the Jim Lee Wolverine and stuff. And there, and Scott Williams was like, yeah, yeah, we were cribbing Barry Windsor Smith. And you see the stuff that they yeah. gravitated to mm-hmm. when you see these kind of hatches, you know, like there's an organic quality to BWS that really does get like commodified. Yeah, it or becomes something. decorative. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's stamped out. It's becomes it's mechanical. Yeah, the organic quality is gone. Yeah. Some of those highlights that you're talking about, they're colors. Uh-huh. You know, it'll be like the yeah, white it's highlight on, the on a bicep. It's on right. the cover. Yeah, exactly. They would draw that. They, yeah. yeah. Those Jim Lee X-Men have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I used to copy that when I'd copy Jim Lee drawings. Spr- yeah, I think you're supposed to do that. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to draw that little thing because Jim Lee does, and he's the most successful guy. So why would you not do what the most successful guy does? I get it. What a money page this is. Oh, yeah. Boy, Lady Deathstrike's so cool with those long, sharp fingers. Really demonic. And, and he sells the, the sort of, um, the planes of her mm-hmm. outfit with that, with the color. Yeah, they're underlit. Almost like it's the light reflecting off the snow and hitting that little bottom. Yeah. You see the, the cool colors of the background fade into warm as the violence escalates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that is a nice transition. That's a good trick. All the while, uh, using using white She's got as those highlights n- on her guys. Nosferatu fingers. Mm-hmm. Totally right there. That's like the Edward Scissorhands mm-hmm. gimmicks. It all just looks so good. And keeping the same pace with the panels. This is a great spread. You know, it's nice that, that the spreads line up in both the, the comic mm-hmm. and the right. Essentials version with those horizontals. You know, people talk widescreen and, mm-hmm. and stuff in the in the 2000s. That was such a popular phrase. But it's like, here we go, right? This is your action blockbuster. Yeah, I mean, you could see Jim Lee perfected this kind of totally. face. Totally. That's a, I bet you could find that face in some of those Jim Lee x men I mean, that's the back cover. I mean, that's the front cover of uh, the foreground character in, in um, well, Hardcore. Uh, the 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 Valiant comic cover issue number one like like he draws that face a million times right. he figured it out the the widescreen thing this is also something uh, Barry Windsor Smith's been doing from day one he had like a cull story that that never really got published one of his earliest and it's it's all this it's all these and it's just it just reads so well yeah like the like it's so awesome to see the pristine black and white but he's clearly clearly drawing it with his idea of color yeah. in mind. And it really is a finished piece mm-hmm. when you see the issue. And he does stuff like, those are teeth that he's coloring with with uh, magentas. Yeah. You know, like, that's such a bold choice. Like, who would think that? It's yeah. white, it's magenta, and it's cyan. That's a lot of color to put on teeth. Yeah, honest to goodness, man, I think there might be some 25% yellows in there, too. It wouldn't surprise me. 
He's got all his tools about him at this point. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love Weapon X, but I don't know that there's anything in Weapon X that we don't see here. That's true. And heck, for all I know, he might have started working on Weapon X shortly after. He probably did yeah. start working on it not too long it's after It's a big, this. ambitious work. That's, hey, that's I mean, that's certain. I, I, he's still working on that, that monsters, that Hulk thing during all of this, too, <laughs> you know? Mm-mm-mm. It's like foam cord. Yeah, the the tube coming out of her nose. I was looking at this last night being like, was that there the whole fight? <laughs> <laughs> that is so cyberpunk. It it's, is. It's got one shoe off. Yeah, I wonder like, about you, that too. You know, you, you know you're in bad shape if you're walking around with one shoe. Yeah, go see that one in the snow. Go see that one episode, uh, The Pine Barrens of uh, Sopranos. And then our final piece, Wolvie is who he is. I mean, that's, that's Jim Lee, too. Like, Jim Lee will shade faces yeah. like that. Completely. And still the big, broad shapes. This is a really nice page, too. At this point, like, he's done with all the money shots. You could really pack it in here, and he doesn't. You get a nice landscape. This close-up of the two hands, so much drawing in those hands and fingers and knuckles. Yeah. He doesn't really give himself a break through this. You'd think there, you'd reach a point where it's like, okay, I'm running out of time, running out of energy, let me... But no, it, it carries all the way through. This is a standalone story. Uh, he didn't... He had more time to work on this than your than your job, or no doubt. Like, And, and this is an, an, a period of time where he's coming into the game and he's doing special projects. Like, He's not taking on regular monthly work by by any stretch. And anyhow, this is... Uh, this is one of those fun ones. I was digging through the archives, went through this. I was like, I saw this page, and I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, I got this in the essential. What must that look like when I pulled it out? Only Barry Windsor Smith can color Barry Windsor Smith. Decent title for, for a video and good corroborating evidence for my argument. You guys good to go? Yes. Okay, Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design Monster number one. This is a retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk, over 10,000 pages referenced in this book, available wherever comic books are sold. And you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see more of how I make comics and more of my comics and original art. Red Room Trigger Warnings uh, is out on the stands as we speak. Issue one is out there uh, on a monthly basis. The next ones will follow. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. Banned in 26 countries, banned in seven comic shops. But guess what, man? You go to the comic shop owner and say, let me get a Red Room. They're going to order it for you. No problem, man. They want to take your money. Uh, you can read these comics before they hit paper on my Patreon. Shouts to everybody who has joined my Patreon uh, in droves in this past week. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Three bucks for the archive there. More than 200 pages of comics up there uh, right now. New strips every Tuesday. Hit my link tree up. You can get to all those links. When you're grabbing Hulk Grand Design, pick up a copy of Fantastic Four Grand Design if you don't already have it. There's uh, Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, uh, which is now also in, in an edition in Italian. Check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show, and my Patreon. Go to patreon.com, search Tom Scholey. What else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Jimmy, given the merchandise orders, we'll be on our way. Make more comics.